Okay, so uh, I will talk for about 40 minutes and we can do like a formal question and answer for people who have a kind of formal personality, but also others can just stop me, like, you know, in the middle of saying things or make announcements and <laughs> put things on the table. <laughs> but I'll just, do a, I'll just quickly run through uh, my life uh, to, to bring bring my bring uh, the presentation to the, the things I've been working on more, more recently the things that excite me now but I think it's good to kind of contextualize this a little bit um, this is this is my kind of web page uh, it's my CV I've stopped updating this now um, it's actually quite hard to maintain an interest in yourself you know over so long um, so I, I started out um, as one of Thatcher's children. You know, I was, I was homeless, I had no education, I had no money, I was, uh, didn't know what to do with my life. All of the kind of things that I was brought up to, to um, value had been destroyed. And we had kind of, you know, the, the Reagan, Reagan Thatcher years of individualism and uh, I'd been brought up to be a, a bit of a socialist really. So. Um, I was drifting around and uh, I was doing various things like writing poetry and skateboarding and but I'd, I'd, at that point I'd never met an artist you know that, that's the kind of impoverishment I had at this, even at the age of 18 I'd still never met an artist in my life and uh, I realized by traveling around and meeting other people that you really need to have some skills and you know whether it was making like bracelets or something you know when you're living on the beach or something and uh, I decided I had to get a, a skill so I, I I remember when I was a like a very small child there used to be on the television uh, these very small things programs not adverts for products but kind of adverts for crafts and one of them was making church windows another was working in a nuclear power plant and uh, so I remember the stained glass one and I thought that's what I want to do and so I, I found a job that was trained and I worked for three years making church windows and that's when I met my first artists and started to do design and uh, actually yeah, make things. So I'll show you. Um, okay. No, that's the wrong one. <laughs> So I would make uh, windows for private houses. Oh, these are these are like small tests, and I would make church windows. But I also did graffiti. So um, here's a piece of uh, graffiti stained glass that I put in an old factory, and uh, I got this is one of my first encounters with the police. Uh, they came they came along and said that I was stealing it, whereas it, I was actually putting it in. It was obvious I was putting it in, but someone had reported that I was stealing it. And uh, I was very young then and angry still and uh, I actually threatened the police with a hammer and that was, uh, that was quite effective. Uh, later on in life I thought I should always be polite to authorities and uh, that generally got me in more trouble. Um, so I, I, I remind myself now that you, if you want to be like a player, if you want to be taken seriously, you always have to have power, you have to project power. And as pers for, so even for your own personal security, you can't just submit. So even in times when you feel threatened, as now I feel threatened now with the, you know this new Cold War, you can't just sit down and hope for the best. You've actually got to go out and you've got to start fighting, uh, fighting for your own survival. We'll come back to that later. Anyway, so yeah, I worked worked with church windows and uh, public buildings for three years and uh, did some experiments with graffiti, stained glass, and I, eventually I realized that you, this is very limiting. It's a very limiting media, working with glass, and uh, so I started working on the street. Um, um, doing kind of, this was a, uh, an intervention with uh, cars, so uh, 
I waited at a car park in the city centre and photographed every car that came in with the, you can see here, the number plate and the driver visible. And then quickly went, this was before digital cameras existed, so then I had to go and get these developed very quickly. And I put, them, put these on the cards and then put them on the windscreen with this message saying, you're part of this conceptual performance or something about environmental, blah, blah. Put them on the windows. And, uh, and then came back later, you know, these, these were commuters. They, they went, were there at work for eight hours or something. And uh, then we'll watch their re response they'd see their picture of themselves on their car windscreen and this got this got widely widely reported it was a mystery you know why was who was it and the police were involved and i measure the effectiveness of my art by generally the security response from the police or the military intelligence i don't really get covered by art critics um, I did a lot of uh, posters. This is an early morph. This was done by hand. You see, tea, uh, worm, child in the womb to a TV. And uh, this. Even if I got up early and went to the local print project that was in the library, there's the only computer in town, in the city that I had access to was in the library to print out posters, design and print posters. I could generally have one ready or you know, 30 or 40 copies and have them on the street by the afternoon. But this, wasn't, this, this still wasn't um, immediate enough for me. So I started doing chalk drawings. I didn't find any things like this. And I covered the city like, over a three year period. Me and, me and my friend, he used to do like beetles and dogs. And I did all these kind of bones and things. We'd go out every day and we'd just draw everywhere. And the advantage with chalk is that there's, people believe it washes off in the rain and most of it does, but if you do it in the right places and the right conditions, you could last 15 years or so. So you, you could be a graffiti artist, but you didn't really have that risk you know, if we're going to jail. You know, at the time when I was doing this, even uh, there was a centre in Bristol, which was the European uh, kind of database of graffiti art, it was in uh, Bristol in Barton Hill. Even this the organisers, people had the archive of photographs. They went to prison for five years for conspiracy, not even for doing any graffiti. So it was at that time, it was very risky to do anything on the streets. But now, you know, back in Bristol, I was there yesterday. There's all these free walls where you can go and spray all your kind of like hip hop style art, and even if the neighbours complain, the police won't arrest you. So it's interesting how things reverse. Mm. At this time as well, I, I I had this idea that I wanted to kind of get to the forefront of what I'd, you could say now like discourse or media media frontier um, so I was running a radio station I had a pirate radio station for a year and a half and uh, I was trying to set up a TV station a pirate TV station but that's technically a little bit difficult for me and I was also uh, experimenting with uh, computers that I'd find because because it was Thatcher years it's, it's all this kind of creative destructive capitalism you'd have whole state organizations that would just be shut down so all of their technology would just put, be put out on the street so you could one day you'd be walking around and there'd be like 50 computers and it'd be the tax office and it'll be all their data as well and you just say oh, I'm going to take three of those I'll take the printer and then so you, and modems you'd find modems in the mid 90s early mid 90s so I, that's how I gained access to computers and computer networking and I started running a bulletin board. Anyone, anyone remember bulletin boards? So I had a bulletin board in my cupboard. And eventually, uh, via CompuServe, I got onto the internet. And uh, for me, it was, it was totally amazing from being a street-based person to being able to connect 
Do anybody, does anybody remember Ver Veronica? It was a search engine before even the World Wide Web. And you could, you could access actually the hard drives of all of these computers around the world and all these interesting documents. Most of them were at universities or whatever, so it would be a lot of research, documentation. But you would, you know, your, your, your sense of uh, scope and range was magnified by like a thousand. So you'd normally you'd be looking at walls in the street thinking, what can I put on that? Um, to affect the local people and then all of a sudden you realize actually I can communicate with people in South Africa and no one's going to stop me. Yeah. So um, I started developing uh, mailing lists, I'd collect all, this is a time when you could email a, a newspaper and they, they would, they would uh, read it what you'd sent. So whenever I travelled I'd, in the airport, I'd look in all the magazines and all the newspapers, and get all their emails, and I had this huge mailing list. So whenever I did anything, I just sent 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 out my own. It got reported because it could have an effect. Of course, now you wouldn't, no one would pay any attention to email. Well, I'll come back to that later. The, the news story on that, but um, so and, and this was a time when there wasn't even any spam. You know, we were the kind of first spammers you know we were the there were no porn sites there were there were no you know there was no junk mail except from artists you know <laughs> um, I, so I, I still um, still were doing things on the street at that stage as well this is a, a piece of graffiti that's um, this was in a show recently in Russia a street they were doing a show about street internet street street internet art and so I would write this uh, URL wherever I went uh, started off just on the street and uh, if obviously if people saw it and it it made any sense to them because at this stage most people wouldn't know what a website was you know but some people didn't they'd write it down and then they'd go and look it up they, they didn't have a computer in their pocket they couldn't like just what's this you know they'd have to go back to their office or back to their school to look that I mean they'd ask them these questions where did they see this and who was it by and why why and all the results were recorded here and at the time I was still you know I was still a young young person I thought uh, Publicity was a really good thing, and uh, so this got covered in Wired magazine uh, after about six months, and it completely ruined the project because it was about being present at the site where the URL, URL was, and experiencing that, and then getting in contact. But then it, it just became a thing that people who were surfing the internet would read about on the internet, and then they'd type in all sorts of bullshit, you know, so I had to shut it down. For like six months, maybe we'll see that here. It might start to say wired or something. But then I restarted it, and uh, then I, I I mostly did it inside toilets because um, I wasn't at that stage. I wasn't walking around on the street anymore. I was in the airport, you know, and it, the toilet wall was the kind of free space. You know, you go into a restaurant, you can write on the wall, you can write on the, you know, You'll see a lot more towards the end of this project. People have seen them on toilet walls instead of street walls. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the mid-90s and internet art because um, it's probably been discussed quite a lot, maybe here, but uh, unless people really got some particular questions. But one thing, it was kind of culturally and uh, economic revolutionary time. You know, what was the most significant technolo technological change of the 20, um, 20th century? It would have been the internet, I'd say. You know, the motor car was very important and some other communication, but it was probably the internet. And so. If you're around in a revolutionary time, one of the things that defining things about a revolution is it doesn't make any sense because everything, all your values, all, all the things you rely on have changed. 
So I don't really understand what happened then. You know, I would, you know, made some friends and with organisations and people and documented the things. But what what was it all about? And it's very hard to say. And uh, I don't think there have been very many really good books or exhibitions about that really clearly say said what happened in that time. You know, you can, as partition practitioner, you can remember it with a warm feeling. You know, oh, that was a really good time. We did some really good stuff. But what did we do? I don't know. So you can look at something like this, location equals yes. <laughs> Why did I do that? You can see in the URL, it's uh, got the IP number, the time and the date. But what does that mean? What it, it must have meant something at the time. It must have been part of a, a discourse or reaction to something. Anyway, so uh, we'll skip over that. Skip over the net art period. And uh, it was very exciting, and uh, but then it came to an end, like all big changes, they, they stabilised and uh, I wanted to continue my work, continue developing and uh, didn't want to be just this former internet artist. So I, I started to look around for a new area of work, new area of uh, practice and what, I was very interested in genetics and genetic manipulation because it was, a, it was a point where code could come back to the street. So you could code a, uniquely code something or you could uh, modify something and it would ha have a material effect. You'd have a new organism that would uh, have a, a political impact. So I ended up, uh, this, this was here, wasn't it? Superweed? Yeah. yeah. Where is it? I've lost it now. It's up here somewhere. There. So at the time, there was uh, corporations were quite honest about what they were intending to do. Uh, they hadn't realised that uh, this new medium would uh, change change their 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 business model and especially the communication strategy. So at the time, Monsanto, their stated business strategy or intention was to irreversibly insert themselves in the food chain. Okay. <laughs> so no corporation would dare to say something like that now. You know, to, to business people that sounds really good. Okay, irreversible, that means they can never be taken away, that there's guaranteed profits. Any investment I put into Monsanto is going to be there forever. You know, so to irreversibly insert yourself in the food chain means you control forever what people eat. But how do you do that? You have to do it by destroying the agriculture system that's been developed over the past 10,000 years. And you have to destroy it permanently, not just break it down there or change it. So how do you do that? You have to do it by releasing toxic, toxic organisms into the environment that will destroy all of nature. Yeah. And they said this publicly, it's in their, it's in their kind of marketing thing. And uh, for a lot of people, they, they found this quite upsetting that uh, one corporation would own the food chain and they would intentionally release these uh, toxic uh, organisms into the environment to do that. So we felt compelled to, to somehow fight, fight Monsanto and these other organisations. And uh, this, was, this was my attempt at doing that. So it was, it was to make a a plant that couldn't be killed, so you, you'd have these, you'd have crops, uh, a commercially viable plant. And the, but if there was weeds in amongst them, the profit would be gone; it'd be diminished. You only have to have like five percent weeds in a crop, and it, it's not profitable anymore. But the way you deal with that is you kill all the weeds. You say this plant is illegal; it's going to die. And uh, Monsanto developed a some plants that you could spray with a weed killer and they wouldn't die. So everything in between died. The weeds. So I thought it'd be really nice to give these weeds a, a specialness. So if we can take the, the genetic genetic traits from the super plants, super crops and put them in the weed, then they'd be it'd be back to square one again. There'd be an evil and even playing field as we say in the 
in, uh, in England. So uh, I did what's now called as crowdfunding. You know, I asked people for money on the internet <laughs> and I got $500 and uh, I used that to obtain the, the genetic material and, and to do the research and the, pay for distribution of this, this kit. So, like all good hacks, it was just very simple. Um, oops. It came down to a bag of seeds, but the seeds were ones that would breed with each other. You know, once once the once the plants had grown, they'd cross pollinate, and also they were also like their enemies. So they were somehow friends, sexual friends, but also enemies. And so all you had to do was grow them together, and you produce this um, family of super weeds that would somehow then fight against Monsanto. So this uh, this was a good lesson for me in about how how extreme you can become as an artist, how much trouble you can get into. Um, the main problem I had with this project is that people in my own community didn't believe it. it. You know, one of the things I tried to set up to show was that with a very small budget, because this is a time where you needed a million dollar laboratory or budget to do any genetics. But I wanted to show that with $500 you could do an effective, uh, not only effective political campaign, but um, actually do some a bio, you know, bio art of some kind. And uh, most of the people in my media art scene, they said it was a, a lie, and uh, but um, and that it could never work, and I never actually did it. But I was saved, and who was I saved by? Let's see if it's still still down the bottom. Novartis, a competitor of Monsanto, who also were working on the same thing of taking over the food chain, they tested the they tested the kit in Basel. And they said, yeah, this is this works. This works, it's true, and it works. So my kind of reputation was saved by that. Not saved by, you know, my fellow activists who denounced me. Um, but because it worked as well, it got me to, into a lot of trouble. But also got me in to work with some other people, so N55, do you know, anybody know N55 from Copenhagen? They decided that they wanted to, this was during the war on terrorism, the height of the war on terrorism, they decided that they wanted to attack, I think it was Sweden, with a bioweapon as provocation, just as to, to get the war on terrorism kind of discourse going. And so they, they built these rockets, these are the rockets that Hamas use. Yeah. And the uh, they weaponized the superweed and they fired them over the border. Now for me to be driving around, you know, with a missile <laughs> in your city centre, I was already uh, classified as a terrorist in the UK. I was banned from travelling to the United States and every time I went in and out of the country I was interrogated by military police for like three hours, between three and 24 hours. Yeah. So to see, see artists with a real missile with a bioweapon in it, just cycling around. It was a very good contrast for me. Okay, super weak. Any any questions about that? No? So then I, I kind of actually did finally retire then. I, I had been threatening to retire in the late 90s. But uh, I went and worked in uh, an art centre in Bristol as a volunteer and spent a lot of time climbing and digging holes in the ground and being quite physical. And then I started uh, remembering my tra kind of travelling travelling past and how friends who had been mentioned earlier had been uh, 
put in prison temporarily, being put in cages. I was uh, I was with uh, Alexei Shulgin. He was put in a cage. I think it was in Croatia, actually. Yeah, we were on our way to Ljubljana through Croatia, and he was put in a cage on the border <laughs> for twelve hours. It's a little, it's a small one as well. It was, you know, it, was, it wasn't just like a room, a big room. It was, it was, uh, it was like an art piece. He was put in a cage like a tiger. Yeah. Which was which was funny because the the title of the uh, well meeting I would say yeah. Chinese, but meeting uh, uh, was uh, Beauty and the East. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I start as I said, I started to think back to these times about the traveling and the troubles that we we'd got into on the borders. I thought, wouldn't it be nice if you could travel freely, especially since you know we we live in the European Union. That's uh, where there is are no border controls and we're all one people but my experience uh, of myself being now being classified as a terrorist and my friends that can't travel freely and uh, I had a friend who was Serbian who was living in uh, Spain and we were doing a an exploration in Paris, the Paris Underground, she wanted to come and she wasn't allowed to go to France. So I thought, well, let's smuggle her in, let's just um, see if she, she can cross the border between France and Spain because theoretically there's no border controls there. So we decided to go up to the up the coast from Barcelona up to France and cross the border over the mountains. And uh, so this is a uh, documentation of that. There's me, the shopping bag, no kind of special equipment. Oh, I had a map and a compass. We got lost. But this is uh, anyone know Vahida Rimukic? She's a, she's a very good artist from Belgrade. That's her. The borders at the top there. Um, we didn't encounter anything on the way to stop us. But this is the border. So you got Spain on the left and France on the right. You can see even the land management is completely different, and you have this wire. And we didn't take a picture, I don't know why, but up on the hill was a watchtower and there was like a helicopter as well. And this is, this is an open border of Europe. And, uh, so we, we crossed, but there was, there was, nobody did anything. So that inspired me to, uh, to do, try to attempt all of the borders in, in, in Europe. Because at the time it seemed completely absurd. Like as an artist, you have to upset everybody you know, you have to get into trouble, you can't just be a conformist, you know, if everyone's saying oh, it's, it's European Union, it's all open, it's all friendly, you have to say, no, it's not. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there, for instance, um, Roma people, kind of gypsies, were not allowed to travel around the European Union. They get to a border between, say, the Netherlands and Belgium and they'd be stopped. Yeah. Same with football supporters. I, I'm, I'm sure there are not many people who want to fight for the human rights of football supporters but they are people and in some cultures football is very you know important and it's not in my country it was related to violence a lot and right-wing nationalism <laughs> but the football supporters were prevented from leaving the country or traveling around also activists so um, you know I remember there was uh, some activist meeting I think it was Barcelona or Madrid everybody who was going you know, from the UK, they had their passports taken away. You just couldn't go. Yeah. Other people were turned away at the border. So there were, there were these border controls. And so I, I thought, there's probably a lot more that we don't know about. 
So I set out to uh, try and cross all of these borders that should have been opened, but many of them weren't. So um, the UK, the UK one is is militarised, but the other ones you, you'd expect wouldn't be. So um, it's Hungary, Austria one, yeah. It's kind of classic, classic border. You know, you, you drive, you can drive over the border very easily and go on the train and you don't you don't recognize any police anywhere but uh, if you kind of poke around a little bit you find out that actually there are um, signs of border controls especially over, over rivers and you, you see people you see people in camouflage kind of in bushes as well hanging around and uh, so as well, well on the train as well between um, yeah, th I think it was uh, yeah, I think it was Hungary and Austria. There were people, police in normal clothes. So you, they don't stop you at the border when you get out of the main station, say at Munich, you're arrested. You know, you think, well, how did that happen? And uh, so the border co border controls were often invisible and in different ways. So in the UK, the main way that you can get deported, I'm not sure it's still the case, but when I was doing this project, was from the London Underground. Now, it wasn't It wasn't necessarily that you'd be stopped in the street or you'd be stopped at Heathrow Airport, if, because there, there are laws to kind of facilitate or protect you. But for instance, if you're on the London Underground and your ticket is invalid for some reason, maybe you have, don't have one, you decided to travel black, or you got the wrong ticket, then the, the staff from the, the the metro will, will stop you and if they think that you're, there's something different about you they can then call the normal police and the normal police can then say well actually there's not you're not quite regular and then they can call the immigration police and then you go into the immigration de detention and then you get deported maybe six months later but that happens at the, the ticket barrier to the to the station it doesn't happen on the on the the coastline or the airline So that got me thinking about general status. So I'd, I'd done all these kind of, I'll show, I'll show the UK, um, French border, France, UK border, though, before we get on to that. So this is the border between France and the UK, apart from the sea. But if you want to go through the Euro tunnel, the road link or the rail link, you have to, you have to, you're confronted with things like this. And to even get to this fence, you know, the whole area is patrolled by the French riot police, 24 hours a day. And uh, so you have to adopt kind of like, you know, military techniques to get even to this fence. Or you're, you have to be guided by, you know, traffickers, human traffickers. And, uh, I was very interested in fences and at the time I organised a workshop on climbing fences not to get over them but to treat them as like sports objects so you change the way you think about things like how do you think you would get to the other side of that fence for instance you know there was evidence that people just cut through it you know but on the other side there's uh, dog patrols and cameras and you get caught pretty quickly you can't you could cut a tree down maybe but uh, one of the things, does anybody know the mathematician Gödel? Yeah, he's, he's, he had one of his theorems is the incomplete, incomplete theorem, which is like a hacker's charter. It says every system, every rigorous system can ask questions about itself they can't answer. So if you're into theology, you could maybe think there's a clue there about the existence of God, you know. But also, a fence like this has a hole in it, it always has a hole. And this one actually stops. You just you go walk down the end, and it stopped, and you can walk around the end. <laughs> so you can. Right, my kind of point here is that you can see an obs obstacle, and you can think I'm going to brute force that, or you can see it as there's a way around it, or you can change the way you think about it, and uh, you just get to the other side. But other people just you know cut through it.
this was the train that I wanted to get on. Uh, the, the way I wanted to cross this border, it, you know, I, w I used to be a bit more into comedy and irony. And so I wanted to, uh, um, most people wanted to get into the UK illegally. I wanted to leave the UK illegally. So I wanted to do it on one of these trains. And so I had to research both, so both ends of the tunnel. So I'd research the UK end, how to get on the train, managed to get on the train, but I also needed to know how I could get off the train in France and get out of these fences. So that was my plan to escape the UK in the reverse direction. But uh, by being in these places and meeting people who were so desperate and learning that you know people had lost their legs or been killed, it was no longer funny, you know. So I, I never actually did that trip. And it wasn't until Ten years later, that I started travelling on these trains. Well, I haven't really done a project with them, like official art project, but uh, I start. I learned how to travel all around the UK on the on these trains, freight train hopping. I can't do things like that now. I've got children. Um, anyway, so all of those things were very physical, and I I, I realised that a lot of these controls now take place on databases and kind of. Uh, administration systems that were invisible um, and you know I, I had a very material impact on that upon me is that I, I could no longer travel effectively so if I wanted to come here to do a lecture I knew that it wouldn't be possible because I'd be delayed you know I'd go to the airport and I'd be questioned for could it be half an hour could it be 24 hours you know and on the way back again I could be so I just would be an unreliable worker you know so that I, start, I decided I wanted to look into that, these invisible controls. Because when you're actually stopped at the border, you know you're stopped, and you know why. You know, they, they, there's a person in front of you with a gun, you know. But when you, when you no longer get benefits, or you can't get a bank account, no one actually says why or when you go to America they don't say well, you're banned you just don't get in and you can try all different ways and you never get in <coughs> so as, as this for me this is very interesting this kind of invisibility and uh, the kind of paranoia and the, the fantasy that you could you could you could it generates in your mind or you could play with you're not dealing with a beach, you know, or a river. You're not trying to cross the river, the Rhine, or something like that, which is is obvious that there's an impediment there. So, with this, I started to look at the kind of impediments of uh, that are applied to you through language. So I started off. Um, with the idea to make a map of the UK system, administration system. You know, I was I was known or the, the net art people as like the as the heroic kind of net art heroic net art practitioner. So, you know, as an artist you you, are, you have to you have to be absurd as well. You this kind of character, you know, wear a uniform and and uh, you do these big things and you say you're going to save the world and this is this is a similar thing I said I was I as an individual on social benefits didn't even have a job at the time was going to map the entire UK administration system this is a thing that you need a government department to do and, but I decided I'd start and see where it went and I've been working on this project now I think it's 15 years still mapping in the database I've got I think it's 24,000 entries of all the different statuses. You know, there's been this scandal recently with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, you know, that they've got 5,000 markers on you, or everyone in the United States. I've got 24,000, you know, so I'm still ahead of these people, I'm still ahead of Facebook. And the, thing, the big difference with this is that Facebook, they're trying, to, they're trying to map the system, but by looking at the way you make the system, you know, but you're all imperfect. I know you all think you're perfect and that you're you're conforming to all the rules and you know but you'll never you'll never be able to look 
at one of you or even a group of you and say, what is the system? What are the rules behind all this crazy activity, all this clicking and this typing? The only way you can do that is actually research the system directly. So Facebook, uh, they're still behind me. And Cambridge Analytica, and the people who got Trump into power, supposedly, they're still behind this project. So I like that, you know. And uh, through this project, I've come into quite a lot of um, places and people that I wouldn't normally as an artist, because, you know, it's, well, I'll come on to that later. So even, even well, my point here is that even though you do something completely absurd, you say you're going to do something that's impossible for an individual to do, the very fact that you try it, you may end up doing something, or at least opening doors being opened to you that would never, never normally be opened. Anyway, this is, uh, this is when I could get social benefits. This was the main one here, income-based job seekers allowance. It, so on the first entry here, are all the requirements you have to fulfill to get the money. So you need to be able to um, be a man or a woman, a certain age or being unemployed. You have to provide a name, a postal address, so there's a little formula you know, that this department follows and if, if you, out at the end of the formula, if it's a true, then you get the money. If it's a false, you don't. And these are all the things that are dependent on having that. So obviously one of them would be um, having some money, so you can see that anywhere, recipient of income. But then all these other organisations will take that into account with the way they deal with you. So that's the structure of the database. Everything references, well, this is a, a very basic one. It's a number of years, something, something or more other entries in the database. So it's a kind of closed relational database. And uh, so I started off with just these kind of benefits and grants, bank accounts, Facebook accounts, all these kinds of things. And I moved into uh, the corporate world as well and uh, surveyed that and also the kind of biological world. So I've got all the native plants in here and our relationship with them because, you know, we actually do fundamentally depend on plants for all of these things and animals. Anyway, this idea that I wanted to make maps of certain subjects. So imagine you you come to Zagreb and you become a student. Uh, how do you become a student in Zagreb? And what are your possibilities once you are a student? So it'd be a map like, much like the city map of, ro of the roads. So you know where you are and you can see, oh, there's some parks there, there's a river there, there's a cinema there. You know where you are, you know where you can go. And so I want to do the same thing with the system. so that people could be more mobile, they could uh, have more opportunities. Uh, let's see, this, anyway, so all these kind of classic, uh, so this is one is like, uh, example, how to vote. You know, once you're registered, you can vote and how that will affect your life, you know, once you're actually re recognized as a voting citizen. I worked, I worked with uh, homeless people working on a map of homelessness, how people, because when you're homeless, um, the uh, responsibility is all yours, how you became homeless, and then it's the responsibility or the glory of the system to save you. Yeah. So when you're, anybody been here homeless? Living on the streets? So when you're homeless or living on the streets, um, you feel even worse because it's your fault that you're there. Yeah, and the, and then these these good agencies that are maybe feeding you or they give you somewhere to live or for the, just for the night, and uh, but with this map, with the homeless map, it became obvious that it was just equal responsibility. There there were organisations and procedures for making people homeless. You know, to be evicted, to lose your benefits, to to be sacked from your job. So. The people I were working with, that was the main thing. You know, I thought I'll make a map to show them how to get out of homelessness. And they will all get off the street. They will all suddenly get apartments and credit cards. 
they weren't interested in that. What they were really interested in was that there is actually a system there that makes them homeless and perpetuates that. And they could see how they'd got there and where they were. Anyway, so I made lots of these maps. Um, along the way I discovered that there's a really crucial uh, kind of concept and subject or object, however you want to think about it, uh, that underpins all of the system. And it's, it's called the person. And there was a lot of mystique around this, mythologies at the time in the UK and America about the natural person, what it was. And so I decided I wanted to, to make a map of that. And it was very difficult. It was a very contested subject. But along the way, by doing that, I discovered that you can actually make new identities if you follow the rules. If you follow the rules that we, um, well, we do every day, the follow the rules of being persons. But if you also follow them in a certain way, you can make new persons that are accepted by the banks, accepted by the state, accepted by the police. And you could have multiple ones. So you could have many new identities that are legal. And this is the, uh, it took a while to distill this down into a, uh, a very simple process, but this is this is a pro this is a flow chart that shows you how to make a new identity. That you start on the left, and you end up at the on the right with like a debit card and all these kinds of things. And uh, the first one I made like took six months to make, and I think it's five thousand pounds. And I I refined it and refined it and refined it, and now you can make one in an afternoon for like five euros. So I, I, I run a series of workshops, I think it's like for three years, all around, all around Europe, uh, training people how to make new identities. Anyway, I'll just show you the latest work. That I'm so along the way, you know, there's, especially, there are these kind of instances where there's this kind of catch-22 or the paradox of certain situations in the system. Like, so when you move somewhere to a new city, you don't yet have a bank, you don't have an apartment. To have an apartment, you need maybe a bank account. To get the bank account, you need an apartment. So there's, there's these kind of, these bad cycles that you get caught in. And uh, I started to notice this when I was mapping the system. You, there were all these kind of cycles, all these things that refer back to themselves that we can generally consider as, as a negative, negative part of our, our existence. But then it started to become apparent to me that this is how the system maintains itself. This is how ideas maintain themselves through circularity. As you can see, a bit obsessive with this, and quite a lot of maps. <coughs> so then I decided to uh, look for these these circles, these loops. I kept this uh, I kept this secret for quite some time because I thought it was too dangerous to have in the public. With that, um, without it being more advanced, because you know, again, Cambridge Analytica and the, the kind of manipulation of the democratic process has come to the, come to the news. I think it's three days ago or something like that. Um, what what these maps are? They're they're semantic maps. So they're they're maps of meaning, and they're, they're maps of people's thought processes. So if you can find. Uh, embedded in or embed manipulate uh, kind of thought paths of people so that they constantly think of the same things even though they don't realize it their minds always come back to the same subject and have a lot of power so I did I tried to try to bring this to kind of like the alternative scene to say come on let's develop this because this is what organization social media they're, they're ultimately working on this they're, they're trying to make a map of the system and then they're going to try and condition you to be not be able to think certain things to only ever think certain things and other areas will be unthinkable and the, as I mentioned earlier I've had 
interactions with military intelligence and uh, it was four years ago now they tried to recruit me and they for this new kind of artist army and I was like well why 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 you're always you know we're always told we're unimportant they said no 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 this is the psychological warfare division for the British military they said no 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 our primary global adversary now it's not ISIS not Al Qaeda it's not Russia or China it's artists yeah and we we're, we're creating an artist army and we want you to be part of it so that was really a really good encouragement for me because my career was flagging a bit at the time and you know I don't get written about or anything don't get invited to too many places but for the military to try and recruit me for the work that I was doing because I was an artist they now consider artists the most dangerous people on the planet and why is that? and they said it's because they, they can imagine another future another reality and they can communicate that and of course to you know kind of imperialist criminals yeah, they, they don't want you to think something different this is exactly what Facebook's been doing they, they've been finding out what you can imagine, what you're thinking, and then feeding it back to you. Yeah? They're creating these loops in your own mind. So that's what I've been doing. So let's take uh, <coughs> let's take this one for instance, artist. Now what's special about this map is that every point on the map goes through the central theme, which I think is probably there goes through the central theme and to every other point on the map so you only have to draw I only have to bring your attention to any of these things on the map and you will end up with the conclusion which is the subject of the map of being an artist yeah and then you will go off on a big journey on another loop and come back to being an artist again so any point on this map that any any suggestion you know whether it's an advert or some kind of directed <coughs> communication to you. This is what Cambridge Analytica has been doing. Will bring you back to the logical, seemingly logical conclusion of what they started off with. Yeah. So they have this, they have this technology, but it's not as good as this yet because they, they, were, they don't have a map of the system. They only have a map of your imperfect performance of the system as a group. But I have a map of the system. And their map, their mapping is only five thousand, and mine's nearly up to twenty-five thousand. So it's five times more effective. But you know, I'm just an artist, just an artist individual. So these are the maps I'm working on now, that will generate. Um, you can do it for any any point on the system, and you look for these loops. So there's an algorithm that searches, and some of the, some of these maps can maybe take forty-eight hours to compute. So for me, it's, I, I love computers, and for me, computers aren't just about watching Netflix or pornography or being popular. There's this potential to do amazing things that I didn't draw this. This comes out of computer programs. So it's like this very modernist excitement that you put some data in and press the button, and you have something like this that reveals you a truth that you didn't didn't know. So. I'll just show you the latest ones. As I said, I'm looking at mostly plants. So this is... I'm working towards an exhibition in Hamburg. In, oh. <coughs> in, uh, in the fall. Let's see if we can get any of these to work. Black on tree. Yeah. So some, of the, some plants actually we have a very long and uh, tight relationship with. And uh, this, one, this one only really produces a few things in our lives, but uh, it's a blackthorn and it produces this slow, you know the, the gin, the English drink gin, that gives it the distinctive flavor is, is this plant. It's, the, it's our version of the generica. You, is that the right word for the plum, in, the wild plum? in Croatia, is it generica? It's like a yellow one you see on the side of the road. But it also, for instance, has these thorns. Yeah? And with those thorns you can make fishing hooks. So this is how people in my country for tens of thousands of years would catch fish. It's a forgotten, it's mostly forgotten now. But it's from this plant, you can catch fish from it. 
And of course, you know, we're going through a great collapse now. It's the Anthrop Anthropocene uh, extinction event. You know, within maybe 10, 15 years, we're all going to die. We'll be dead. You know, either it's because nuclear, all the nuclear power stations explode or climate change or whatever. So, but we, along the way, we're going to have to re-engage with our plants, our ancestors, our friends. And so I've been making a map and uh, as I said, I'm working towards this exhibition in Hamburg and it's how we can go back to the forest as, as a group of people, not as a Facebook group or something, but as a group, as a human, as human group, get to know our families, family, you know, trees and plants, and survive a little bit longer. And, uh, so I guess that's the end, really. I've been talking for an hour. <laughs>